Welcome back, time travelers. We have all traveled through time and space to be here, uh, and I am really, really excited today. This is absolutely one of my favorite lectures to give uh, in class to my, my graduate students, and I think this is gonna be one of the absolute most useful lectures for you. So today we're gonna talk about one of the most fundamental methods in solving partial differential equations, which is separation of variables. It's a way of turning a partial differential equation like Laplace's equation into a system of ordinary differential equations uh, that we know how to solve. And then we can reconstruct this kind of spatial solution of this, this partial differential equation from those, those ODE solutions. So this is a cornerstone of modern applied mathematics in engineering, in science, in computation. Uh, and so I'm going to walk you through the separation of variables and I'm going to introduce it specifically to solve Laplace's equation in two dimensions for the steady state heat distribution on this uh, rectangular metal plate. So we're going to uh, solve Laplace's equation in 2D to find the steady state heat distribution and we're gonna do it using separation of variables. Okay, this is a big one. We're gonna cover some of the most important concepts in, uh, in engineering math. Uh, for example, we're going to show that when we take our separation of variables and we get our system of ordinary differential equations, we will essentially derive that the Fourier transform, sines and cosines, a basis of sines and cosines, are the eigenfunctions of Laplace's equation on this domain. So really important connections, and I'm super excited to walk you through this. Uh, believe it or not, this is actually the first uh, weekend I'm back in Seattle since our year-long uh, sabbatical at Caltech. Uh, and I couldn't wait. I've been planning uh, a whole set of videos for a while, so uh, I decided to come in uh, and film this up. All right, and whenever uh, you solve a partial differential equation, of course you need uh, some combination of initial conditions and boundary conditions, depending on if it's a PDE in space or in time. For this Laplace's equation, and remember Laplace's equation, uh, del squared u is just uh, the second partial derivative of u with respect to x squared plus the second partial derivative of u with respect to y squared equals zero. So this is a partial differential equation because uh, u is a function of x and y, and we are representing uh, conservation of, of, of thermal energy or, or you know, the steady state heat distribution in terms of these partial derivatives with respect to x and with respect to y. Uh, and, and we derived the heat equation in the last lecture in two dimensions as, a, again, a conservation of thermal energy in a volume or on a square or on a rectangle. And if you take the limit as time goes to infinity, so that's what I mean by steady state, all the transients die out, then you arrive at this uh, steady state heat distribution equation given by Laplace's equation. Now, we need some uh, boundary conditions to make this a well-posed problem that we can solve. And so the first boundary condition uh, on the left wall, so what we're going to assume is that we impose a constant temperature distribution on the left wall, the top wall, the right wall, and the bottom wall. And so uh, u at x equals zero, that's the left wall, for all points y, we're gonna say that that equals f1 of y, some, some specified function f1, uh, which is a function of the y variable, which goes from zero to some height h. Similarly, we're gonna specify at the top boundary condition u, now this varies in x, u of x comma h equals f2, and this is a function of x because it varies in the x direction. Uh, we're gonna specify a right boundary condition uh, u, at uh, x equals L for all of these points y equals F3. Again, this is a function that varies in y. And finally, we specify our fourth boundary condition at the bottom, which is U of uh, x, again, fixed at y equals zero. That's what the bottom line equals F4, and this is a function of x. So okay, now we have a partial differential equation and enough boundary conditions that this is a well-posed problem. I'm gonna walk you through solving this using the separation of variables. And this is actually kind of a gnarly problem to solve with all of these boundary conditions. And so one of the things I really like to do in my class, I think this is uh, illustrative of how you 
take a complicated problem like this and break it down into a simpler problem. Because Laplace's equation is linear, meaning uh, if I had a solution u1 and a solution u2 and a solution u3, if I add all of those solutions up, that is still a solution of Laplace's equation. It's a linear partial differential equation. And so what that means is that if I have this full set of boundary conditions where I have you know, f1, f2, f3, f4, and I have my solution u of x comma y, okay, that's my full solution, this is equal to the sum of four simplified problems where in the first problem I have f1, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so I've, I've kept my f1 boundary condition, but I made all of my other ones 0. We're going to call this u1 of x and y plus uh, another set uh, 0, f2, 0, 0 plus 0, 0, f3, 0, plus 0, 0, 0, f4. And again, the solution of each of these uh, sets of boundary conditions is u1, u2, u3, and u4. And because this is a partial differential equation that is linear, if I add up these four solutions, u1, u2, u3, and u4, it is a solution, again, of Laplace's equation that satisfies the boundary conditions f1, f2, f3, and f4 at those four sides. So it's, I'll show you in this, this video, so this is going to, um, my guess is this is gonna be like 30 or 40 minutes, so, so buckle up. Um, I'm gonna pick this one here because this is the easiest one for me to solve with the boundary conditions. And then as kind of a homework problem, you can solve these other ones and add them up to get the full solution. So I'm gonna pick this problem here, uh, and I think I should just probably write this out as uh, this is where we're gonna remember what problem we're solving. So we're solving del squared u equals zero with the boundary conditions 0, 0, f3, 0. Let's call this f3 of y. And I'm just going to write down uh, my boundary conditions to be very, very explicit. Uh, so I have u of um, x comma 0. So u of x at the y equals 0 is 0. I have u of uh, x at the top of my square at, at h also equals 0. I have u of x equals 0 all along y equals 0. And I have u of x equals l at the far length of my domain for all points y equals this f3 of y. So these are my boundary conditions. This is the problem we're going to solve. Uh, and we're going to solve it using separation of variables. Okay, good. Uh, I'm going to erase this because I need all the board space I have. Uh, if this takes too long to erase, I might speed it up. All right. Uh, time travel. Good. So now we're going to solve this simplified problem uh, of Laplace's equation using separation of variables. And this is an incredibly powerful technique, uh, which essentially was introduced by uh, Jacob Bernoulli in 1690. And 1690 was a very, very interesting time in Europe, uh, mathematically. So if you think about it in that century, uh, from 1600 to 1700, uh, Kepler had used Tycho Brahe's data to solidify the Copernican model with the sun at the center of the solar system. Galileo had been imprisoned or under house arrest and died in his home uh, in the middle of that century. And uh, two or three years before Jacob Bernoulli uh, introduced the separation of variables to solve this isochrone problem, Newton released his Principia. So just an incredibly uh, rich time in, uh, in the history of math and physics. And I actually think that the separation of variables is one of the culminations uh, of this kind of rich thought environment. So the idea is that we are going to take our solution, so we're gonna say u of x comma y. This is a huge assumption. We're gonna say that this equals 
some function of x, some function in the x direction, times some function in the y direction. Now this is a really big assumption. We're assuming that these dynamics in x and y can be split into the product of functions of x times functions of y. Now that means that there are no weird cross terms here, um, like, uh, well, this means that I can factor my solution into a term, a set of terms in x and a set of terms in y, but that it is separable into, into those two functions. So I'd actually like you to think of some examples of functions of x and y that are in, unseparable, that cannot be split uh, into this. I'm thinking of things like x plus y squared. x plus y quantity squared um, is, is not separable in this way. I don't think. You should double check that. I, I just made that up on the spot. Okay, so the first assumption, this is a huge assumption, is that we are going to assume this uh, separation of variables. And then what we're going to do is we're gonna plug this into our partial differential equation, and we're gonna get ordinary differential equations for f and for g that have to be satisfied. So uh, let's do this, so if I do del squared of u, and remember this is partial squared u partial x squared plus partial squared u partial y squared. Okay, so um, partial this, and again, we're gonna do the chain rule, so the, the second partial derivative of this with respect to x is just f x x. Subscript here means partial derivative, I took two partials with respect to x times g of y. Now you could say plus f of x, g, x, x of y, but since g is a function of y, its partials with respect to x are zero, okay? Okay, so this is the first term of Laplace's equation, the second derivative in x, plus the second derivative in y is again f of x, g, y, y of y. And of course, this equals Zero, okay, we know that this equals zero. Good, so, so this is Laplace's equation. If uh, we assume that we can split our function u into a product of f of x and g of y. And so now what we're going to do is kind of play around with these a little bit. So I'm gonna move one of these over to the right-hand side because both of these add up to zero, so I can move one over to the right-hand side. And I can say, so I'm gonna rearrange this and say f x x of x times g of y equals minus f of x g y y of y. And now I'm gonna collect all of my f terms on one side and all of my g terms on the other, everything that's a function of x and everything that's a function of y on different sides of the equation. And I'm going to get uh, f x x divided by f, these are both functions of x, equals minus uh, g y y over g, okay? Because these are, um, I, I collected all of my, g, my y terms over here and all of my x terms over here. Good, uh, so this, if you think about it, only is a function of x. So even though these are partial derivatives with respect to x, f is only a function of x. So these are just normal derivatives, and these are normal derivatives uh, with respect to y. And one of the really cool things uh, about separation of variables is this next step, is that these two equations, because they equal each other, these, these two terms equal each other, they both have to equal a constant lambda, so I'm gonna say this is a constant. And if you have watched my videos before, you know that I love eigenvalues lambda, so I am calling this lambda because this is going to be an eigenvalue, you'll see that in a few minutes. Uh, but these two terms have to be constant, and, and I always pause and I ask my students to think hard about why this is. So I'm gonna pause for a minute and you're gonna think, I, I got these equations by taking this you know, partial uh, differential equation equals zero, so I moved terms over, I divided and collected like terms, you know, my x terms and my y terms. Why do those have to equal a constant? And the answer is because if this is only a function of x, and if this is only a function of y, 
then for any y value, I, I vary you know, this equation, it still has to be equal to this one at every single x value. So because this is only a function of x and this is only a function of y, the only way that those can equal each other is if it's the constant function. If it's like you know, 1 equals 1 or 2 equals 2. You can't have x equals minus y for all y and for all x. So the only way this is true for all y and all x is that if they both equal a constant. Good. And so we're actually getting really close to starting to solve this problem. So we've, we've still set this up, and I'm going to take a big step back, um, or you can jump ahead to the summary. Or, you know, I'm going to have these summary moments where I summarize all of the steps, but I'm going to keep going just a little bit. So what we've done so far is we have assumed that we can split our function into a product of f of x times g of y. We've plugged it into our partial differential equation. And now we have recovered uh, this relationship, which I claim is two systems of ordinary differential equations. So this, in my mind, is two systems of ordinary differential equations. We have uh, f x x equals lambda f. Okay, this is a ordinary differential equation in, in f of x. Okay, f is a function of x. So you really, you could think of this as like f prime prime equals lambda f. We know how to solve this. Uh, and we have another differential equation, g y y equals minus lambda g. And if you're a little quicker than I am, I've been thinking about this, so I know the answer, but if you're a little quicker, uh, than I was, you'll recognize that the solutions of this are going to be things like plus or minus, you know, e to the plus or minus root lambda t or root lambda x. And solutions of this are going to be things like sines and cosines of root lambda y's. Okay, so these solutions of these are going to be sines and cosines. Solutions of these are going to be exponentials. Good. And importantly, these have uh, our boundary conditions here translate into like initial conditions for our ordinary differential equation. So at f, uh, we're going to use our, um, our x equals 0 and x equals l conditions here. So f uh, of 0 equals 0 and f of l, uh, f of l has to equal f. 3 of y. Okay, this is a little messy. I'm going to, I probably shouldn't have written that down. Uh, but the x equals l condition uh, is going to come from this one. And similarly, we have these conditions uh, on g. g ones are easier, which is g at 0 has to equal g at h has to equal 0. Those are these, uh, these conditions here. Okay, so now what we have is we've turned our nasty partial differential equation, which is a function of x and y, you know, two spatial variables, and we have, by separation of variables, shown that now we can reduce this to two systems of ordinary differential equations. And these ordinary differential equations, it's actually a whole family. It's infinitely many ordinary differential equations for any value lambda that I choose. Any value lambda here, this is absolutely true. If this is pi, if this is negative 2, if this is 15, this is still true. And so I get this whole family of ordinary differential equations I solve. But I'll point out that even though any constant lambda makes this true, only special lambda, remember eigenvalues are special values, only special eigenvalues lambda will allow me to satisfy these two sets of boundary conditions, uh, th these kind of ODE initial conditions. So that's, that's really important. Okay, good. Um, and I'm just going to think for a minute. Um, yeah, realistically, this, uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna erase this one. We're gonna come back to this boundary condition. So, so I think at this point you should, you should be seeing this looks like a much easier system to solve because I have really easy, uh, my boundary conditions give me really easy kind of uh, con constraints on, on my solutions here. Whereas the F variables are gonna be nastier because this right hand uh, side uh, imposed temperature distribution. So that's going to be a little hairy. So I'm going to solve this GYY equation first. I'm going to find which special lambdas allow me to satisfy these boundary conditions. And then once we have those special lambdas, we'll solve F and we'll take all of our solutions and we'll plug them back in to reconstruct U of XY.
Okay, so that's what we're doing. Um, good, I think we should just get into it. Um, we're already pretty far into it. <laughs> so, okay, so now what I wanna do is I want to solve my GYY equation. Um, I might just do it down here because I think I have enough space. Uh, okay, so GYY. Now, we have a few different cases. We could do it if lambda is positive or if lambda is negative. Okay, so if lambda, let's say lambda is um, greater than zero, okay? I'll let you think about what happens when lambda is equal to zero. That's an interesting case, but, but let's just think about this for now. So if lambda is greater than zero, then essentially uh, this gyy equals minus lambda g, the solutions of this are sines and cosines. This is literally, uh, you know, g prime prime equals minus lambda g. Uh, and we know, so you could, uh, you could assume, you know, if gy equals e to the alpha y, and you double differentiate it, you'll find that the eigenvalues uh, of this have to be uh, complex conjugate pairs, plus or minus i omegas. Um, and so we know that we're gonna have solutions are sines and cosines. And so uh, we're going to say that our GYs are equal to, um, mm, because G zero equals zero, I can't have any cosine components. So I could write down, you know, sine of root lambda y plus cosine of, you know, root lambda y, but I can't have any cosine term because of this boundary condition, because a cosine of zero is one, it's not zero. So I'm only gonna keep my sine term, so sine of uh, root lambda y. And now I have to find the really, really special root lambdas that satisfy both of these boundary conditions. So we know that sine of, you know, root lambda y is zero when root lambda is zero or pi or uh, two pi, three pi, four pi, five pi. So I'm gonna basically say that if root lambda equals some integer multiple of pi, uh, and I'm pretty sure I needed this to be, okay, so <laughs> when g of h, when I plug in, uh, so lambda, root lambda h, has to equal an integer multiple of pi. When root lambda times h, because I plug in h here, when that equals an integer multiple of pi, then this uh, satisfies that right boundary, um, that top boundary condition. So, so that's my condition, is that root lambda equals n pi over h, uh, essentially for all integers n, for n equals one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, okay? so. Uh, for n equals one, two, three, dot, 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 dot. Uh, if n equals zero, that's also fine. You can kind of work that out, that if n equals zero, then this is just sine of zero. It's just a, it's zero. Uh, and so that, that's also totally fine. So, so now we have come to a important kind of crux, which is we know that this equation was true for all lambda. And so these differential equations are also true for all lambda. But there are only very special lambda that satisfy these boundary conditions, the bottom and top boundary condition of my PDE. And specifically, they're the, they're the, uh, the lambdas that satisfy this equation, so that sine of root lambda y equals zero when y is zero and when y is h. Now it's easy, every time y is zero, this is zero, but when y equals h, I need this special relationship for lambda. So lambda has to satisfy this equation, uh, and I'm gonna get rid of my, uh, my root here, and I'm gonna square my other side, so lambda equals n pi over h quantity squared. So if lambda equals that, for any value of n that's an integer, this is a valid lambda that satisfies these boundary conditions. And so now what I have is a countably infinite set of ordinary differential equations for f and for g. A countably infinite set. For every n, I get a lambda, and I have a corresponding ordinary differential equation that satisfies my boundary conditions. And the solution are signs with that fundamental frequency uh, of, of root lambda in the, in the vertical direction. 
Good. Um, so I'm going to write this out just very, very explicitly so I don't forget. I'm going to say um, maybe probably should have color coded this. G of Y equals sine of uh, N pi over H Y. So all of the functions G in this separation of variables that satisfy the top and bottom boundary conditions, all of them are of this form for an integer value of n. That's super cool. So we've solved half the problem. Check. OK, I, this video is going to go long. <laughs> We're halfway through. We've solved half of the problem. OK, so now we, have, uh, we know what these guys are. The g of y's are signs with uh, these perfect kind of harmonic. So if you think about a guitar string, uh, these kind of harmonic uh, eigenvalues that satisfy these boundary conditions. Actually, very much like a guitar where you have pinned this in two places. There's only certain signs and cosines that can exist and satisfy those pinned boundary conditions. That's another application of separation of variables I'll show you in, uh, in another lecture soon. One of my favorites, actually. Good. Um, I'll let you think about what happens. So we already talked about when lambda equals 0. That's the same as when n equals 0. That's a perfectly valid, boring solution where this is the 0 function. So that's not interesting. And if lambda is less than 0, th this is a good homework problem. If lambda is less than 0, then this equation now will have solutions e to the plus and minus square root of lambda y. And there is no way of satisfying both of these boundary conditions equaling 0 uh, with e to the you know, lambda y and e, or, you know, root lambda y plus e to the minus root lambda y. There's no way with just exponential functions I can satisfy these two boundary conditions. So lambda has to be positive, and it has to have uh, this very special set uh, of lambdas to be, to be valid. Okay, so essentially the big step one was that we, um, I'm going to draw this out because I think this is actually really uh, important and I have a little cartoon I draw in my class, which is the, the first step after separation of variables and getting this uh, system of ordinary differential equations was we solved the one with easy boundary conditions. Always make your life easy. Solve the easy boundary conditions first, the ones that are zero, okay, so in the y direction in this case. Uh, and what we did was we essentially said that, you know, in the y direction from, uh, let's say, 0 to h, the only solutions that can satisfy this differential equation with these boundary conditions that it has to be 0 at these, these conditions are these very, very special sine waves that have, you know, the right... Uh, I'm not very good at drawing sine waves, but very, very special sine waves that have the right um, frequency so that they exactly are pinned to zero at the bottom and the top of my domain. So that's super cool, okay? And now the next step, the second step, is that we're going to use these lambdas and we're going to solve our hard ODE uh, in F. Okay, so now we're going to solve our, our ODE in F and we're going to use the solutions of those. Eventually we're going to use our boundary conditions to, uh, to get the coefficients of this, this function. Okay, good. Uh, so that is what we're doing now. So we've just solved the, the y's. Now we're going to solve the, F, uh, the f's. Uh, and I think this actually is not that bad. So where do I want to do this? Um, maybe I'll just cheat and use my notes. Um, okay, so we know that fxx equals lambda, which is n pi over h quantity squared of f. Good? And we know that the solutions of this are going to be f of x. These are positive numbers here. Uh, and so we know that the solution of f prime prime equals a positive number f is going to be some constant uh, a e to the n pi over h x plus some other constant b e to the n pi, the minus n pi over h x. And technically for every, this is an ordinary differential equation for every integer n, it's a whole separate differential equation. So these are possibly different co coefficients a1, a2, a3, a4 for each of those values of, of n. So this is actually not that bad. I should have boxed uh, this solution here. 
that corresponded to this solution here. And this is the solution of my x equation now that I know that my eigenvalues have to be uh, root n pi, uh, or sorry, have to be n pi over h squared. And here's where we get to use our, our, uh, our easy x boundary condition. So our easy x boundary condition is that f of zero has to be zero. So I can plug zero into both of these equations, and e to the zero is one. And so I get uh, f of zero equals a n plus b n equals zero, which means uh, b n has to equal minus a n. Okay, so anytime I see a b n, I can just swap this out for a uh, minus a n. I hope you caught what I did. I plugged in x equals zero. That killed the exponentials, it just became ones. And I got a n plus b n has to equal zero, which means b n equals minus a n, okay? And uh, I'm getting a little out of space here, but essentially the sum of e to the plus, you know, alpha x minus e to the minus alpha x is just a hyperbolic sine function. And so this uh, f of x, maybe I'll just write it down here. So my f of x is equal to a n. Uh, it's actually equal to 2 a n hyperbolic sine of n pi over h x. Good. So all of my x solutions have to have this form. This is just a basic, basic like trig identity is that this equals 2 a n cinch uh, of n pi over h x. You can just you know verify this yourself. It's pretty easy. Uh, if you like complex analysis, this is like a homework problem in complex. And so now we also have this term. Good. Uh, okay, so I'm just gonna barrel through. I'm gonna go all the way to the end. I'm gonna write out the whole solution. And then we're going to recap what we learned, and we're also going to think about like what happened if I had different uh, boundary conditions. Maybe I'll talk about that a little bit. If I had different boundary conditions here, these were fixed temperature. I basically have these uh, sides, let's say, in an ice water bath so that they're fixed to be temperature zero. Same on the left side. And maybe I hit the right-hand side with a blowtorch to, to you know, give it some, some uh, constant thermal uh, profile. But, you know, so these are fixed temperature u equals zero. It, what if the, we had a, a no flux condition? What if we had an insulating boundary condition? The partial derivative of u sub x equals zero or the partial derivative of u sub y equals zero. I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through this in a little bit, but essentially what would happen is we would get slightly different boundary conditions here. Maybe we would get, uh, you know, g sub y of zero equals g sub y of h equals zero, in which case I would get cosine solutions being the only ones that can satisfy that zero flux condition. And these would all become cosines. Um, other things, uh, other other things you could do uh, here. I think if if I had an insulating boundary condition on the left, then I would probably get coshes here, hyperbolic cosines. I don't quite remember. You should work through this yourself. Okay, but so now what we have is that the solution of this partial differential equation uh, in in U is equal to, and remember this uh, will have, this is true for every single integer n for n equals zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. And so because it's true for all of those, if I add up all of those solutions, that's the solution of u. So for every single lambda here, uh, I get one of these solutions, and if I add them all up, that's my global solution to u. So this is equal to uh, the sum from n equals uh, one to infinity. And the reason I'm not doing n equals zero is because um, it's boring because sine of, of uh, zero is always zero. So you could do n equals zero and write this out, but the first term would be zero. And we have, uh, I'm actually gonna write my f of x's first. So I have my a sub n times, uh, times what? Times, let's say I could do uh, a of n cinch or a of n sine. I'm just gonna do my sine first, uh, maybe my cinch first, of n pi over h, this is in the x direction, times sine of 
and pi over h in the y direction. So it actually doesn't look that terrible. Uh, I get cinches in the x direction and I get sines in the y direction. Okay, and cinches, you know, it's gonna look like a, a decaying exponential plus a uh, growing exponential, so something kind of, you know, almost catenary-ish. Uh, and these are, are harmonic to satisfy those, those boundary conditions in Y. And I've gotten rid of this two here because I am lazy and because this is an undetermined constant. So I can just say that I am defining A to have that uh, factor of two in there. This is the solution. So this is the actual solution of Laplace's equation. Okay, actual solution of Laplace's equation using separation of variables. Now, separation of variables does not always work. There are problems that are non-separable. Okay, there are problems where you can't separate uh, the solution into a product of functions in x times a product of functions in y. Uh, plenty of examples of that. But when you, so, so what I would recommend is if you think your problem is separable, you make this assumption, you go through the steps, and if at some point you box yourself into a corner where you can't satisfy your boundary conditions or your initial data or whatever, then you might conclude the separation of variables doesn't work. But in this case, we didn't hit any walls through this procedure and we actually were able to derive this full solution uh, PDE here. Okay, so I did not determine these coefficients a n yet. This is kind of uh, a pain in the butt. I will do this in a minute. These a n, these undetermined coefficients a n, these are super important. There is one boundary condition I haven't used yet, and that is this one. So if you think about all of the steps we've done up until now, we've used the bottom and top uh, boundary conditions to solve my, my functions in y to get this, this, you know, these perfect eigenvalues and these eigenfunctions in the y direction. We have used the left boundary condition to, for our f equations to show that b has to equal minus a, which gave us cinches, it gave us the form uh, of this equation. But these coefficients a, n, we haven't determined what these are yet. And the only information left to determine these coefficients are these, uh, this, this kind of nasty boundary condition on the right. Okay, so I'm gonna do that in a minute. Um, but what I wanna do right now is I just want to do a big recap, okay, because some of you might not want to pay attention to this, you know, deriving a n. I think it's amazing because this is going to basically use the Fourier transform. If you think about it, these coefficients, these coefficients are going to be the Fourier transform coefficients of this function f3 in this basis uh, of signs. So it's absolutely amazing connection uh, to Fourier analysis. Um, so the, the recap here for me is, is the most important part. Um, we have introduced one of the most powerful methods of solving partial differential equations, which is separation of variables, 1690 uh, Bernoulli. And essentially it allows us to transform our partial differential equation. You make this assumption, you plug it into your partial differential equation, and you get out two systems of ordinary differential equations. You get a set of ordinary differential equations in x, and you get a system of ordinary differential equations in y. Where are my y's? In y. And we know how to solve ordinary differential equations. They're relatively easy, especially linear ODEs that are second order. All of our solutions are gonna be exponentials or sines and cosines, that's it. Okay, and so that's, you know, that's, that's big step one is, you know, step zero is assume you can split your variables. Step one is plug it into your PDE and derive a system of ODEs out. The next step, step two, is pick the one that has easy boundary conditions, not the one that has hard boundary conditions, the easy one, and find the special values of lambda, the special constants lambda, that uh, allow you to satisfy those boundary conditions. And for me, this is one of the most beautiful parts, is that those special lambdas are actually eigenvalues. They are honest to goodness eigenvalues of this ordinary differential equation that satisfy these boundary conditions. So we have eigenvalues lambda, which are these uh, you know, n pi over h squared for integer n, and the corresponding 
eigenfunction. So these are the eigenfunctions corresponding to those eigenvalues, lambda. I'm actually going to write down lambda n. Okay, these are all, uh, these are my lambda n's. I have countably many eigenvalues lambda that satisfy these boundary conditions. And corresponding, I have eigenfunctions. Okay, so I used to have eigenvalues and eigenvectors, but now we have eigenfunctions because the solutions are functions. We live in a function space, a Hilbert space. If you want to learn more about that, check out my Fourier analysis series. We talk all about, you know, Fourier transforms and these eigenvalues and, and eigenfunctions. Okay, that was step two. I'm losing track here. I think that was step two. Solve the one with the easy boundary conditions. Step three is now that we have determined those special lambdas, plug those into our hard, our differential equation with hard boundary conditions. Uh, and one of the boundary conditions was easy, this one here. So I use that to figure out that bn has to equal minus an. I, that tells me that I get cinches out. And I am almost done. I, that's like three steps with a zeroth step, and we get this solution here. And the only thing we haven't done uh, is solve for this an. And I'll just remind you, you know, this is a homework problem. I hope you all do it. Maybe I'll do a little follow-up video of some of the other ways we can perturb the system. But this was for u equals zero, and u equals zero, and u equals zero. It's very interesting to try out what happens if the you know, partial derivative in y equals zero. What if I have insulating boundary conditions? That changes uh, these to g y, you know, sub y of zero and h equals zero. And that would change this to being so that only the cosine solutions can have their first derivative be zero on these. And so I would get cosine solutions here, same fundamental eigenvalues, same cinches here, but my uh, gy's would now be cosine functions if I had insulating top and bottom, if I put styrofoam on the top and bottom of this. So really cool things. Once you know how this works, you can pretty much solve all of these problems. You could solve this on a circle, on a disk. You could solve this on you know, a ring. You could solve this on lots of different geometries if you know this kind of basic procedure of you know, split, plug it in, solve your differential equations, solve the easy one first, find your eigenvalues, plug it into the blue equation. Last thing I'm gonna do now, so this is kind of where the video ends, except we don't have these ANs. So the last thing I'm going to do is actually derive uh, these ANs, and we're gonna use our boundary condition, which is, uh, and I hope I have room, this is kind of a mess, is that um, u at my right boundary condition, u at x equals L of y equals this uh, F of y boundary condition. I'm gonna drop the subscript three because I can't bear to write down subscript three every time I have a y here. And that equals this summation up here. So it equals my sum uh, from n, I know everyone hates it when it squeaks, I'm sorry, uh, n equals zero to one of a n, goodness gracious, uh, a n cinch, of, and now I, all I'm gonna do is anytime I see an X, I'm gonna replace it with an L, it's that simple. So I have N pi over H times L. This is a number, that's actually easier. Plugging in X equals L made this easier. This is just a number times sine of N pi over H Y. Okay, good, that, this is just, I, all I've done is I've just re, capitulated my solution and I plugged in x equals l and I've said all of this stuff in my solution has to equal my right boundary condition at x equals l. It's that simple. And now this is where the Fourier analysis comes in. Uh, and it drives me crazy that, you know, when I was going to school, Fourier analysis was its own semester class and everyone thought it would be really cool to learn Fourier analysis because it sounded, you know, neat. Fourier analysis in isolation is boring. Fourier analysis is a tool to solve partial differential equations and physics equations, and I think it's a crime to you know, separate it and quarantine it off from, uh, from differential equations. But the way we're gonna figure out these ANs is what we're now gonna do is we are going to, uh, I'm just gonna write this out. So I'm gonna write out the, uh, essentially the inner product of this function y, so the inner product, and, and if you don't remember what an inner product is in a Hilbert space, a function space, I'll put a link to the video uh, in my Fourier analysis series where I talk all about this. It's actually really easy. It's the integral from zero to h, 
of f of y times my sine uh, n, goodness gracious, n or m, I'm going to use another variable m, h, n pi over h, y, dy. This is literally just breaking f of y into Fourier coefficients. Okay, this is, this is like the projection of f onto the mth Fourier coefficient. So this is the uh, mth Fourier coefficient of, of, this, of this data f, fy. I think of this as data because this is just a function that someone gives me, someone specifies, and I get to use it. And so I'm going to compute its Fourier transform and get its Fourier transform coefficients. But now I'm going to plug in all of this nonsense into that f of y. I'm going to get something nasty, but things are going to cancel out. Okay, so this equals uh, integral, try to make this not squeak, zero to h of my god awful sum uh, of a n cinch, uh, which is just a number, cinch uh, n pi l over h, just a number, times this sign, sine n pi over h y, times this sign, sine m pi over h y d y. Now, uh, literally, I just took, this is the Fourier transform of f y. This is one of the terms of the Fourier transform of f y. And I plugged in this expression of f y, my solution. And what you'll notice now, you know, these are just numbers. These are numbers. And this inner product can only, this, this, this integral from zero to h, this is something you'll learn in Fourier analysis, I call this an inner product between these two functions. These are orthogonal functions if n is not equal to m. For any non-integer n and m, for, for any integer n and m that don't equal each other, this integral is zero. So this is only non-zero when n equals m, which means we can drop this, uh, <laughs> we can drop this summation here, and this n has to equal m. Okay, and this n has to equal m, and all of these n's have to equal m's, and I can probably just make my n's m's without erasing them. And so essentially what we get is that this equals uh, a m, this integral from zero to h will have, uh, a length scale h, again, this is just details over two. This is just from this integral. I'm just showing you what the integral is. Uh, so, so the integral, forget all this junk, this is a constant, this pops out. The integral of these two things when n equals m is just one half times h. It's h over two, so I get h over two a m cinch m pi l over h. Good. And so this is what this integral equals. Okay. Ha, huh. which means I can solve for AM. So now AM, and I'll, I'll just call it AM, equals this thing here, it equals two over H cinch M pi L over H, moved all this over here, times the integral from zero to h of f of y sine m pi over h y dy. This here, and let's just confirm this here is this coefficient. So this is a number, number, number. <laughs> Uh, this is a function of specified numbers, and this is data. This is my boundary condition f of y. So I can determine these a coefficients purely from taking the Fourier transform. Uh, it's, a, it's essentially just some constant times the Fourier transform coefficients of my data uh, on my right boundary condition. So that, that's how you get these a n, which I think is kind of cool. I know this made the video about 10 minutes extra long, and some of you have uh, fallen asleep, so you're welcome if it's late at night. Uh, but I think it's really, really important to show that you actually get these directly from you know, this, this Fourier transform. This thing literally is uh, you know, the mth Fourier coefficient of f of y of my data on my boundary condition. So that's really cool. 
Okay, this is one of my absolute favorite lectures because it tells you how to actually solve PDEs. We haven't been playing around, we haven't just been writing down conservation laws, we actually wrote down the honest to goodness solution. You could plot this in Python, you could plot this in MATLAB, and you would actually get the solution of Laplace's equation for, uh, for that, you know, this set of boundary conditions. All right, thank you.